Hello and welcome to the True Crime Never Sleeps Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Lace. And on today's episode of Murder Monday, we dive into the DC Mansion murders. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Audible, for sponsoring this episode. What is Audible, you ask? Well, let me tell you all about them. Audible is a subscription service that allows you to buy audiobooks that you can listen to from anywhere. Your phone, tablet, car. Audiobook allows you to choose from a gigantic array of audiobooks narrated by amazing narrators that you can listen to anywhere. Right now I'm listening to The Dead Zone by Stephen King, narrated by Oscar-winning actor James Franco. It's the chilling story of a high school teacher who falls into a coma and wakes up with psychic abilities. In all seriousness, audiobooks are great for when you're alone and maybe want to stop with YouTube. Well, let me ask you, do you want a free audiobook of your choice? No purchase necessary? Well, then go to audibletrial.com slash Larry today. Larry 21, excuse me. It's audibletrial.com slash Larry 21 and get your free audiobook. So without further ado, let's get on with today's episode. On May 14th, 2015, a call was made to the Washington Fire Department reporting thick smoke coming out from a mansion in Woodland, an exclusive neighborhood for the wealthy, like Biden. Or should I say President Joe Biden? Within minutes, the first group of firefighters arrived to control the fire and with the main focus of putting outside the, out the source of the fire a bedroom. Another rescue team went in to save any victims that were not able to find their way out. With poor vision, with a thick black smoke in the air, they struggled their way in, but soon they found a body, and then another, and another, and followed by a child sized body. But they were not victims of the fire. They were victims of a cold-hearted murder. They had stab wounds on their body, cuts and bruises on their wrists that indicate that they were restrained for a long time. The victims were 46-year-old father, Savas Savopoulos, 47-year-old mother, Amy, 10-year-old Philip, and 57-year-old housekeeper, Vera Figueroa. Friends and family spoke highly of them and were genuinely fond of them. They were the perfect American dream. They had a successful business, American Ironworks, and a close-knit family that truly cherished each other. Even though they were very wealthy, they remained very down-to-earth and helpful to the community. Only the two daughters luckily escaped as they were at school abroad. The last message Savas shared with her daughter was a witty message about her prom night. What happened to this loving family in this upscale neighborhood? Well, now we're going to break down the timeline of the murder. Starting at May 13th at 4.38 p.m. On May 14th, May 13th, excuse me, at 4.38 p.m., Savas received a phone call from his wife asking him to return to care for their 10-year-old son as she had other plans. Savas was working on a project, a dojo to teach martial arts with its grand opening just two days away. He was reluctant to leave because there were still so many things to be done with such a short frame of time left. But being family, a family-oriented man, he put his family first and returned home. Nelly Gutierrez, his second housekeeper, stayed behind to wrap things up in the dojo. The house telephone line was cut off. By this point, it was believed that Amy, Philip, and Vera were already taken hostage. And Amy was used to lure her husband back. 5.56 p.m. The family's sensitive security system recorded three records of glass breaking. It was a newly installed security system that had yet to be fully activated. While the alerts were recorded, they were not monitored. 6.25 p.m. Based on Savas' cell phone, Savas was nearly home from the dojo. It remained unclear how things rolled out when he arrived home, though the police speculated he was likely ambushed when he reached home. Around 8 p.m., Savas made a call to his sister to take out anywhere from 35000 to 50000 U.S. dollars. While it may seem odd, Safas often goes to auctions. Yet that amount of money made sense if he made a big purchase in an auction. The only thing out of the ordinary was that Savas insisted that it had to be all hard cash, and immediately. The banks were already closed, so it was not possible. 8.27 p.m. The father tried to, his assistant, Jordan Wallace. He asked the assistant to head over to their office in Maryland to wait for an eBay package and bring it over. 9.14 p.m. Amy ordered two pizzas from Domino Pizza with a request to leave the pizza on the front as she had her hands full tending to her son. 
Yes, this was the pizza crust the invader left behind, along with his DNA. 9.35 p.m. Savas made another call again, this time to his second housekeeper, Nellie. He told her not to come in for work as Vera stayed behind to care for Philip, as Amy was unwell. He also reminded her to tell Vera's close ones not to worry, as her phone was unreachable as it was out of charge. That was odd. First, the story about the phone out of charge. Why didn't Vera just borrow Savas's phone and call her husband? Wouldn't the two-minute phone call to her husband be more assuring? Second, Vera has never stayed the night in her four years of working with the Savasas. Thirdly, at the dojo, Amy was away because she had other plans, not because she was sick. Fourthly, he sounded tense. Nellie realized how odd the voice message was, but Nellie never opened the voice message until the next morning, the day of the fire. 10.08 p.m., Savas made calls to the security company regarding his system. Despite the odd hours, the company answered his questions by stating that the CCTV on the front porch would only start recording when it detects motion, and the recordings were saved on a hard drive in the computer in Savas's house. According to the prosecutor's theory, it was likely the invader noticed the CCTV when he went out to collect the pizza. The timeline did match up. May 14th, 6.19 a.m. The next morning, multiple calls were made again to the security company just to make sure none of the footage was stored in the cloud database. Around 8 a.m., Savas made another call to her sister that he needed 40 k After that call, Savas called up the Bank of America to request a $40,000 withdrawal in cash. He then called Ted Chase, the financial chief officer of American Ironworks, to pick up the money. 8.30 a.m., Nellie tried calling Vera three times, but they were unanswered. Around 9 a.m., the Bank of America called back Savas to confirm that one of their banks did indeed have the cash in hand. Jordan Wallace and Ted Chase would then pick up the cash. Before Vera Gutierrez's husband Ronaldo left for his night shift work, he noticed Vera has yet to return home. But he figured that she was probably working late. It became a real concern when he returned home the next morning to find that his wife was still not home and unreachable. Ronaldo then headed over to Vera's workplace, the Savap the family's mansion. He heard little noises like chairs being moved around, but no one was answering the door. About 20 minutes later, he received a call from Savas saying that Vera stayed the night and just left to accompany his wife to the hospital. Savas called Jordan to call back when he was 10 minutes away from the house for more instruction on the money drop. 9.56 a.m. Amy texted Nellie, making sure that the housekeeper does not come in for work that day, even though she was not on duty probably to avoid any un unannounced visitors. 10.15 a.m., as asked, Jordan Jordan called Savas when he was nearby. Savas's instruction was to leave the money in the car parked in the garage as he was in a conference call. When Jordan arrived, the garage door was already open. After placing the money in the sports car, he sent a text to Savas, informing him that the money was delivered. 10.38 a.m., Nellie finally replied to Amy's text, confirming that she was not coming over that day. 1.07 p.m. The security system again recorded, record, recorded records of glass breaking. Soon, the carbon monoxide detector and the smoke alarm went off. One of the passerbys noticed black smoke coming out from the house and called the fire department. 1.45 p.m. Amy's blue Porsche was caught on a traffic camera in Maryland, where later it was torched. So now we got a baseline of the timeline of events that occurred. We're going to dive in now into the investigation. And we're going to hone in on Jordan Wallace for a bit. During the early investigation, the prime suspect was actually Jordan Wallace. When news spread, Jordan and the employees in the dojo were worried for their boss. But Jordan was especially fidgety. He was the only one who went into the house during the 22 hours. He also took a picture of himself with the 40k cash and sent it to his girlfriend, but quickly after deleted it. During the police interview, his side of the story also had inconsistency as he initially said the car was locked and even reenacted the part where he got the key to it, though he went back and changed the story, stating that it was left unlocked. In his defense, he was afraid and pressured by the police. In the interview recorded, it did seem like the police were coming rather strong on him. Early on in the investigation, the police had yet to obtain the evidence of phone records of Savas requesting him to drop off the money. Once the police received those phone logs along with proof that Jordan was nowhere near the mansion other than the drop-off, he was cleared. 
Savasas, Amy's, and Vera's bodies had multiple bruises, brain fracture, fractures, and stab wounds. For Philip's body, the medical examiner found two stab wounds on him. It remained unclear whether whether did he bleed to death or burn to death. Savasas and Amy's cell phones were missing. They found a bat that had blood spattered on it that belonged to Vera. The computer hard drive containing the CCTV footage was also missing. The key evidence in this investigation was the leftover pizza crust, the very pizza crust that they had considered throwing away as usually. Perishable items were not taken in because it was likely that any possible DNA could have been destroyed by the sugar in the pizza. Fortunately, they did turn it in. There was no DNA found on the pizza. From the bite end, they were unable to pull an identity out, but from the crust end, they identified that the DNA belonged to Darren Wint. His DNA was also found on a knife in the basement, and a strand of his hair was found in one of the bedrooms in a construction helmet in the garage. So who is this Darren Wint? Darren Wint was a 34-year-old ex-employee of American Ironworks, fired a decade ago back in 2005. He had a history of violence, assault, and lying. Since 2015, he struggled to keep a permanent job and had to move in with his father and stepmother after being kicked out from his brother's house after a bad argument with his little sister. By May, Darren was no longer welcomed at his father's house and was asked to move out in a month. He was also struggling with his green card as it was expiring. He was still jobless. He usually spent most of his days at home, but on May 13th, the day of the tragedy, Darren was not home, nor was he reachable. He only returned home the next evening to his worried and at the same time furious family for his sudden disappearance. Darren Wentz's frequently used Facebook account was finally active after a day. He finally replied to his concerned New York girlfriend who had been trying to reach him since yesterday. In between messages, he snapped a picture of two white iPhone 6 identical to the missing phones of Amy and Savas and asked his girlfriend were those phones traceable. To which she replied, yes. Later, the picture was deleted. His search history included how to beat a lie detector, countries without U.S. extradition, and hideout cities for fugitives. On May 15th, Darren asked for a favor from his brother-in-law, Godfrey Ailing, to torch his minivan. That odd favor at such late hour sent alarm bells to him, to which he declined to help. On the 16th of May, Darren went up to New York to meet up with his fiance. All of a sudden, Darren was no longer struggling with money. He still was not employed, but somehow had a good chunk of money to get an attorney for his green card. Bought Vanessa an iPhone and shoes, and even settled her rent. Supposedly he got the money from winning a lottery, but there weren't any records of him winning anything. On the 20th of May, Darren Wint was now a wanted man with his face plastered on national TV. Vanessa jumped out of bed in shock, but still ended leaving her apartment with Darren for a hotel that night. The next day, Darren returned to Maryland. And now we're going to look at Darren's testimony. So this is how it began. Three years later, in 2018, Darren's Wint testified that he was offered a painting job by his half-brother, Daryl Wint, to which he accepted for some cash. On May 13th, Daryl said the plans changed and Dar Darren's assistance was no longer needed, but Daryl just needed his minivan for 300 bucks. Darren Wint was dropped off at a friend's place, Ed, but upon arrival, Daryl unknowingly took off with Darren's phone, and without his phone, Darren had no way to contact his brother. He expected his brother to return and pick him up later that evening, but he did not show up. During this time, Ed offered Darren a drink. It made Darren sick, and he had to take a rest on the couch. He dozed off and woke up around 1 a.m., but quickly fell back to sleep. The next time he woke up, it was already 10 a.m., and his brother Daryl finally returned. But he was driving a blue Porsche. And now, trying to explain away Darren Wentz's DNA. Accordingly, Daryl still had some work left to do, so both of them went to the Savopoulos' mansion in Woodland Drive. Darren waited in a sitting room and took up his brother's offer of a cold Domino pizza to fill his empty stomach, but left out the cold, hard crust. Nothing weird struck out to Darren, except Daryl handed the pizza in his dirty construction gloves, and he was instructed to come back through the garage when Darren went out to get his phone from the Porsche. In the garage, Darren was told to put on a construction helmet and vest. When Daryl revealed that they were in fact stealing from their house, Darren was enraged. He pulled off the helmet, strongly refused, and stormed out. It explained his strain of hair in the helmet. So what about the Porsche location? 
missing iPhones in the tow truck ride. His brother caught up with the blue Porsche and offered a ride to Darren to his minivan. They took a detour, which would explain the Porsche location away from Woodland Drive. But his brother did not fulfill his promise and simply left Darren in a familiar neighborhood with a promised $300 and two iPhones. He paid a tow truck driver for a ride to his minivan. During this time, he borrowed the driver's phone to send a series of text messages. When news broke on the very same mansion in Woodland Drive that he had been to, he was worried that he would be dragged into whatever trouble Daryl got himself into. Darren admitted to asking his brother-in-law for assistance to get rid of the minivan. However, he denied the fact that he was the one who torched the minivan, stated that the minivan simply disappeared that night, and assumed that Daryl must have settled it. It seemed like Darren had an explanation for everything that was against him. Here begs the question, why didn't they just call Ed to take a stand for Darren? Ed, the witness that could testify Darren once location for the time of the quadruple murder, was dead. He passed away a year ago when Darren was in lockup. During Darren's stay, there was a shooting nearby, leading to a routine police check at the surrounding area, including Ed's house, but Darren stated that he did not hear anything. Not the gunshot, nor the policeman. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're going to look at the Wint brothers. Stefan Wint took the stand before Darren. Stefan was a supervisor in charge of a painting division, and he did offer both his brothers a painting job at a university, not the mansion. Only Daryl got back to him. On 13th to 14th, the GPS on his work truck, the work timesheet, and Stefan's supervisor confirmed that he was working. When Daryl went, took the stand, he stated that he didn't really remember much the day of the quadruple murders. It was just another typical day until the news broke about Darren, days later. Do keep in mind that it had been three years. The brothers were never mentioned until now. But according to the cell phone location, he was nowhere near the house on the 13th and 14th. On the evening of the 14th of May, Daryl did meet with Darren as he called him numerous times through an unknown number, likely from the tow truck's driver and his dad's house phone. They dropped by a petrol station as, accordingly, Darren's minivan ran out of gas. Then they went to Walmart, where Daryl picked up some supplies for Stefan's painting job. The Walmart CCTV captured both of them, and Darren was smiling. An odd expression to share with someone who supposedly deceived him into attempted burglary and left him nowhere near his minivan. With Darren navigating, Daryl assumed they were driving to his minivan, but he ended up in a familiar industrial park with the minivan nowhere in sight. Darren hopped off the car for a few minutes before popping back in. As they were leaving the area, Daryl noticed black smoke coming off from that area. That was the parking lot where the blue Porsche was torched. But he did not question his brother about the smoke, nor his minivan. He noticed how fishy everything seemed. He did not want to be involved in, so in someone else's business. For the second time on the day, they dropped by Walmart again. But this time, Darren got a little something for himself, and during checkout, the CCTV captured a snippet of his wallet. A thick wallet with a stack of cash. The next morning on the 15th of May, Darren was desperate to get a hold of his brother Daryl, but all his calls went into a voicemail. With how suspicious things went down yesterday, Daryl intentionally ignored over 20 calls from Darren. Daryl admitted that he did meet up with Darren after Darren was officially a wanted man because he needed help to get a lawyer. Daryl didn't want to straight up hand his brother over as he did not trust the system, but the lawyer wanted money orders, not cash. Daryl coordinated these money orders by asking favors from his friends, but soon he felt that he was in too deep. With advice from his cousin, he came up, came to an agreement with Darren that he should turn himself to the police, and later, Daryl would get a lawyer with the money orders. However, in Darren's testimony, he thought they were on their way to his lawyer, not the police. It was during this ride that the U.S. Marshal finally caught up with Darren's location and arrested Darren. So now there's two unexplainable mysteries right now. It was undeniable that it was indeed Darren's DNA on the pizza crust. However, this DNA could have been easily transferred onto it, as proven in the evidence collection itself. A few of the investigators' DNA was also found on the crime scene, even though they are with proper training and gears such as gloves. Moreover, their DNA found was much was much stronger than Darren's DNA. And a mismatch physique. Based on the traffic camera, it seemed like Darren drove Amy's Porsche away. 
torched it before hitchhiking it back. A witness took notice of Amy's Porsche as it was driven in a great hurry despite the jam and bumpers, but he described the driver as a small sized man in a construction vest with short, well groomed hair. The description was a far cry from Darren Went, who was muscular and had long dreadlock hair. In the parking lot where the burnt Porsche was, the CTV caught a petite figure in a hoodie. Dashing away from the direction of the Porsche, and again, it did not match Darren Wynn's build. These were all highlighted by Darren's lawyer. It seemed like any situation that was seen as unfavorable in, pairing, in pinning Darren down was left unanswered. Number one, the murderer or murderers was smart enough not to leave any fingerprints behind and capable of entering the house without any signs of breaking in. Why did the murderers leave such an obvious piece of evidence a half-eaten pizza? Two, the DNA from the hair belonged to a Wint, but was it Darren, Stefan, or even their parents? All of those phone locations can only determine someone's location if that person actually keeps it with them. Number four, why would a guilty Darren Wint submit his fingerprints for a background check for his green card? Are these questions valid for casting doubts or just a rabbit hole of speculations that would obscure the jurors from the truth? After all, these were numerous digital or physical pieces of evidence against Darren Wint. So now we've reached the verdict. In the end, Darren Wint was found guilty on all 20 counts, including murder, kidnapping, extortion, and arson. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So leave us, a, uh, leave us your comments in the comment section below. What did you think about this case? What do you think really happened? Was it Darren that's responsible? Let us know. And as always, if you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support helps the channel grow, upgrade our equipment, bring in new hosts, be able to pay them, hire new writers, researchers, and other necessary um, tools and things we need to upgrade our show and make it 1% better. Your support can help make that happen. And of course, give us a thumbs up if you like our video. Um, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification button to be notified of future videos. As always, thank you so much for watching and listening. We will see you next time.